Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, we're going to be doing another Kahoot, and I'm going to be going over infection control. Now, before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video. You're going to love it, so press that thumbs up button now. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already, and don't forget, I'm now offering a Next Generation NCLEX review sessions. You can reserve your spot for that or private tutoring or a consultation session by going to my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. While you're there, be sure to check out the audio lessons I have available, the audio lessons I made specifically for current nursing students who are struggling in the program. You have to get a really high grade on your next exam. Go ahead and check out the audio lessons I have available. Again, www.nexusnursinginstitute.com. Almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics across my social media platforms, TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. My handle is the same everywhere, Nexus Nursing. So without any further ado, guys, let's get started. Infection control. Select all that applies. So E. coli is known to cause which kind of major infections? Select all that apply. Which kinds of major infections? We have gastroenteritis. We have urinary tract infections, candiasis, HIV, gonorrhea, chlamydia. E. coli is known to cause which kinds of major infections? Select all that apply. Now, guys, if you didn't make it onto uh, the Kahoot, you can still answer on the live. Okay, most of you guys got it correct. And the correct answer is GI and GU, right? Gastroenteritis, urinary tract infection. So E. coli, this bacteria, we find it where? In the gut, in the GI tract, we find it in stool. And so what happens is, um, obviously it can cause infection in the GI tract, but also the urinary tract, right? If somebody's wiping back to front instead of front to back, um, that bacteria can get into the urinary tract and cause urinary tract infections. Now, candiasis, this is a type of fungal infection. HIV, gonorrhea, chlamydia, these are what? Sexually transmitted infections. Make sure you guys know the difference. Select all that applies. Staph aureus is known to cause which kinds of major infections or diseases? Select all that applies. Here are your choices. Wound infections, pneumonia, food poisoning, cellulitis, malaria, Professor D, no clue, I give up. What do you guys say? Staph aureus, what types of infections, what type of major infections do we usually see that it causes? There's more than one answer here. Okay. You guys did pretty good, but not uh, too many people chose food poisoning. So the correct answer is wound infections, pneumonia, food poisoning, and cellulitis. Something that you guys need to understand, um, the reservoir for this type of bacteria is found in the skin, the hair, the nares, and the mouth right? So this type of bacteria can cause wound infections, pneumonia, food poisoning, and cellulitis. Not malaria. We'll see that more like from what mosquitoes. Uh, what is the major reservoir for hepatitis A? Here's our choices. Blood, sexual contact, feces, saliva. 
What's the major reservoir for hepatitis A? Where does this, by the way, hepatitis, this is a viral infection. So we're not talking about bacteria. We're talking about a virus. This type of viral infection uh, virus, where does it live? Where does it grow? Where does it multiply? In blood, sexual contact, feces, or saliva? Feces. The correct answer is feces. So how'd you, how are you guys doing on the live? All right. So um, when it comes to blood, sexual um, contact, saliva, we see that uh, more with what hepatitis B and hepatitis C. But specifically when we're talking about hepatitis A, that major reservoir is feces. What's the mode of transmission for a particle that's larger than five microns and can travel up to three feet? Would it be airborne? Would it be droplet? Would it be coughing? Or would it be sneezing? The mode of transmission for a particle that's larger than five microns, that's your first clue, and can travel up to three feet. That's your second clue. Very good, droplets. So droplets, they're very large par um, particles. That's why they um, travel up to three feet. Airborne are very, very, very small uh, particles. They're much smaller than five microns. And those type of particles can stay suspended in the air for a long time. And when I say a long time, I'm talking about hours. Why? Because they're so small, okay? Select all that applies. What are localized symptoms of infection? What are localized symptoms of infection? Select all that applies here to choices. Pain, fever, tenderness, increased white blood cells, warmth and redness at the site, malaise and anorexia. What are localized symptoms of infection? Okay, so let's talk about this. You guys uh, are doing great. When we're talking about localized symptoms, so there's a specific organ, a specific tissue that's being affected. It's not all over the body, right? We expect to see things like pain at the site, tenderness at the site, warmth and redness. You see fever, increased WBC, malaise and anorexia. Those are what are known as systemic symptoms, okay? Those are systemic symptoms. Other systemic symptoms would be something like uh, if the patient had nausea and vomiting or the patient had like, um, 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 what do you call them? Like, uh, what's the word I'm looking at? The lymph nodes, right? They've They've got swelling of the lymph nodes you suspect um, systemic infection, but when it's localized, really it's one target. It's a specific tissue or an organ that's infected. So it would be pain, tenderness, warmth, and redness at the site. True or false? Antibiotics and oral contraceptives are known to disrupt the normal flora and natural defense mechanisms. True or false? Very good. This is absolutely true. And that's why um, if a patient is on oral contraceptives, once they have to be on antibiotics for a certain amount of time, usually you know, three days, five days, seven days, you um, have to teach that patient while you're taking these antibiotics, you better use a second form of birth control. Otherwise, you're going to mess around and get pregnant. 
very important. True or false? An alkalinic environment kills bacteria and prevents its growth. Is this true or is this false? An alkalinic environment kills bacteria and prevents its growth. True or false? False. You guys do, are doing a great job on the Kahoot, but on the live, I saw so many truths. That is absolutely false. It's the opposite. It's an acidic environment. An acidic environment kills bacteria and prevents its growth. Okay. Bacteria um, doesn't thrive well in an acidic environment, and they definitely don't reproduce or multiply well in an acidic environment. So it's acidic, not alkalinic. The interval between entrance of the pathogen into the body and appearance of that first symptom, what is that known as? Is it the incubation period? Is it the symptom stage? Is it the illness stage or the convalescent stage? That time between when that patient's actually infected, that pathogen enters their body and you start seeing those first signs and symptoms of infection. What's it called? Very good, incubation stage. Select all that applies. Which are examples of sites or causes for healthcare associated infection? Select all that applies. Insertion of a urinary catheter, wiping the patient from front to back, wiping the patient from back to front, improper hand hygiene, using contaminated needle needles, or improperly prepping the skin before surgery? Which would you say are examples of sites or causes for healthcare associated infections? Select all that applies. There's more than one answer. Okay, very good. Everything except wiping the patient from front to back because that's what you're supposed to do, right? That will decrease the risk of healthcare associated infections. But everything else, first of all, look at insertion of a urinary catheter. Guys, any foreign object, anything that is foreign that is being inserted into the body, that is increasing the risk for infection because there's a chance that you're introducing pathogens. Of course, wiping from back to front because the bacteria that's found in the stool and even the stool itself can come up to the front and go into the urinary tract using contaminated needles. And if you don't prep that skin properly and you don't kill all that bacteria on the skin, once that patient has invasive procedure, what do you think is going to happen? Those pathogens that were sitting right there on the skin, those microbes are going to go into the patient's body and cause an infection. True or false? Breastfed infants have less immunity than bottle-fed infants. Is this true or is this false? Very good. False. It's the opposite. Breastfed infants have much more immunity than bottle fed or formula fed infants, I should say. Word cloud. So I want you to type in your answer. An elevated WBC is an indication of what? You know, your WBC is supposed to be five to 10,000. It's elevated. It's 15. It's 20. It's 25. An elevated WBC is an indication of what? Type in your answer. And guys, keep in mind, I know uh, for many of you, these questions seem easy, but I have to do cahoots for everyone. So not only med surge, but I can do, do cahoots for fundamentals or foundations of nursing arm, baby student nurses as well.
infection. Okay, very good. An elevated ESR is an indication of what? If that erythrocyte sedimentation rate is uh, elevated, that's an indication of what? So yes, as I was saying, I have to do Kahoot for the baby student nurses as well. So please don't com complain in the comment section saying these questions were too easy. I have to do Kahoots for everyone. It is what it is. Be nice. There we go, inflammation. When you see that ESR is elevated, you know, usually for men, it should be up to about uh, 15, for women up to 20. Um, when you see it elevated, that lets you know there's inflammation. We don't know where that inflammation is, but it lets us know that inflammation is present in the body. Not only ESR, also um, CRP. The C-reactive protein, when you see that elevated, that also lets you know that inflammation is present. Now, yes, inflammation is a symptom of infection. However, there may be inflammation due to other reasons, but specifically that elevated ESR and CRP lets you know inflammation is present. Last question. What type of precaution would be warranted for a patient with C. diff, scabies, varicella zoster, or MRSA? What type of precautions would this patient be on? Would it be airborne, droplet, standard, or contact? Okay, very good. You guys got it. Contact precautions. You know, when it comes to contact precautions, guys, you're going to wear a gown and gloves. You're going to... um make sure that this patient is in a private room if possible. If it's not possible, you're going to put them in a room with somebody else that has the same type of infection, but um, preferably speaking, you want that patient in a private room. Now for airborne precaution, it would be a patient with something like, you know, uh, chicken pox, TB for droplets, something like, you know, strep throat and standard, just, you know, standard precautions or precautions you use for anyone. When you're coming into contact with bodily fluids, you're going to put on gloves, whether, you know, it's feces, stool, vomitus, blood, you name it. All right, guys, you guys did a great job. Let's see how you did.